Dear Blessed Father, we thank you that we are able to come to know you, not simply because of anything we can do or from our own intellect, our own wisdom, but simply because you condescended. You have made yourself known. Father, you have revealed yourself. And for this uh, reality, Father, the fact that we can know you through your own revelation, how can we but not praise you? The fact that we, you have revealed not only the fact of your Son, and that through your Son that we can all be saved. Father, thank you. We just pray that as we delve into your, um, really, knowledge about you and how you have done things, we just pray that you may help us, help our, our minds have clarity. Uh, Father, we just pray that indeed we may seek to um, not only wrestle with this understanding and, and, and learn, but Father, to put these things into action. Oh, Father, we don't want cold orthodoxy or cold theology, but rather may our faith be vibrantly shown in our lives. Indeed, this is a goal of proper theology. So, Father, we just pray uh, that, that this may be, indeed be des desire for all of us. In your Son's most blessed name, Amen. Alrighty, um, I'm sure all of you have notes now. Uh, thank, thank you to Lucy and Shane for also printing out extra copies as well. Um, now, this is obviously a continuation from last week. We're, seeking, we're not diving into this blindly. Instead, last week we sought to go, well, what is the foundation of theology? What, how do we do theology properly? And so what we're going into today is basically seeing an outworking of theology done. And so some of the foundational things that we need to remember and to go back to is this understanding what theology is is meant to do. And so uh, starting off with this quote, with the notes, and of course, uh, please do uh, follow along with the notes because that's what they're there for. But going through the definition given by Johannes uh, Woolius, uh, Wollibius, he mentions that, cons that theology is concerning God as he is known and worshiped for his glory and for our salvation. So now that we're going into the topic of the Bible, we're going into bibliology, and when we're going into bibliology properly, we're understanding specifically God as he is known. And so indeed, when, when we, the first question we have to ask, well, if God is knowable, how can we know God? How do we know God? And so this is something that throughout the generations, throughout history, both Christian and non-Christian have wrestled with this idea. How do we know God? And so rather than starting with our earthly reason, like we mentioned last week, we can't simply deduce God's existence and go to God of our own accord. We need to understand that indeed there exists an infinite chasm between our knowledge and God. There's no way that we would broach this. There's no way that we can I indeed overcome this, but God himself condescended and made himself known to us. And so by doing so, we now can comprehend him. And so therefore, all, um, all attempts to understand God, to understand his word, must have this as the basis. God has been the one to show he the way to himself. We cannot reveal God by ourselves, just like a blind man can't choose to give himself sight. We're put in a place that we need help. And so as such, God has revealed himself. He has chosen to disclose his existence. And it is this understanding, this understanding that God has chosen to reveal himself to us, which ultimately shows the necessity of this doctrine we're covering today, or one of the doctrines we're covering today, which is the necessity of divine revelation. Now, when you look at the reality of all other religions in the world, you'll understand that all of them are ultimately based on revelation. In, in many respects, when you look at the Abrahamic uh, faiths out there, Islam, Judaism, and so forth, they are all based on texts, sacred texts, this understanding that God has made himself known and it has been recorded. But even the understanding in other religions, which aren't necessarily based on texts, is still based on the idea that God has revealed himself. He has made himself known and therefore he can be worshipped. Right? So this understanding that God has revealed himself is not something in of itself unique to Christianity. It's something which, again, we can look and observe it throughout multiple patterns for uh, different religions throughout history, both modern uh, religions as well as past ones, to actually see that there, there's this belief of divine revelation. But what is meant by revelation? Well, ultimately, 
it believes that there is a God and that God has communicated himself to humanity. And by this, what do we mean? It, we mean that over all of us, there was a veil that we could not take off, but God has taken off. He's revealed himself, and by doing so, he has made himself accessible. God is now accessible to man. But we need to recognize as well, while that is true, we may only know of God inasmuch as he has chosen to reveal himself. So what that means ultimately is that while we may know God, we can only know as much about God as he chooses to reveal. So, so how has God revealed himself? It is here that theologians normally speak of two, two major forms of revelation. The first, of course, is natural, and the understanding of natural revelation is that it provides an understanding that certain characteristics of God are observable through creation. Indeed, this understanding that because the world was, has a creator, then we should be able to see, ultimately, God through his creation. But there's also exists special revelation, which is, on the other hand, is a knowledge which it would be completely inaccessible to us if God did not make himself clearly accessible and known to us. So in many respects, if you were to differentiate the difference between natural revelation and special revelation, you would go that natural revelation is a way that we can know of God. The special revelation is the understanding that we may know God. So natural revelation, let's first turn to this understanding. Now, natural revelation, also called general revelation, is the understanding, that, again, that God has revealed himself through the work of his hands. This is generally segmented into three categories. The first is nature. We are able to observe God by looking at his creation. But the other one is that we are able to observe God through history. God is not a distant God who has created a world and stepped it back from it. Instead, his fingerprint is still evident. But lastly, it is also by our conscience. If we have been indeed created by God, as the scripture tells us, then the imprint of God is in each and every one of his image bearers. Now, when we look at nature, we need to, it's a helpful quote that J.I. Packer actually states, where he states that God's world is not a shield hiding the creator's power and majesty. Again, if this is a world that he has created, we are able to see him. Indeed, everything in this world testifies to the reality that it has a creator, that there is a God. And so as such, we are able to observe that there is this reality, that we are able to observe certain characteristics of God by looking into his creation. Again, like touched upon last week, we are able to see that not only he's a creator of all things, but he is also a sustainer of all things. Likewise, we could even go further and further into actually picking on certain characteristics of God which are potentially observable through creation. Creation itself then is a testament to God. Psalm 19 verses 1 to 3 puts it this way. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. What this is testifying to, what this is saying, that again, every single thing test in creation testifies about its creator. It's unavoidable. Consequently, all creation points to the one who creates it and, and reflects God's divine power, eternity, and glory. The reformer John Calvin equated creation as being a theater of God's glory. This understanding that we, individuals who have been created in this world, are ultimately formed to be a spectator of the created world and given eyes that he may be led to its author by contemplating such a beautiful representation. This understanding, again, as individuals created in this world by our sovereign God, we are able to observe the glory of God through creation. And as such, we are just a spectator of his glory. I think Calvin is entirely right on that one. Instead, in, indeed, Calvin understands that ultimately God is the center of the story. He is the center of the plot. In fact, arguably, he is a story 
Here's the plot. Because as many of us are probably familiar with, not only from the Westminster uh, catechisms, whether the longer or shorter, that man's chief aim is what? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. There's an understanding here that we're part of that great sympathy. We're part of what's happening in creation where we are called to bring glory to God to whom the rest of and all of creation reveals his glory. We are partakers of that and also glorify him by seeing him in creation. And so taking that on point, it's a reminder of what's to come in Revelation. Because what happens in Revelation? Well... Everybody's glorifying God, aren't they? And ultimately, that's the point, in many respects, of what creation should do. So this idea that, okay, that we are living in a world which is ultimately the theater of God's glory is an important point to understand how we should look at creation. It all testifies to him, but what what does it testify to? Ultimately, how glorious he is. So we recognize that ultimately, this truism, but we also understand that, again, going back into this understanding that God is not a distant God. He's not someone who created a world and stepped back. But as is in Calvin's illustration here, the theater of glory is an ongoing production. It's not something God just creates, the story starts and then ends. No, we and all the other generations prior to us are living in, as part of this story, this understanding, this production which is still unfolding. So understanding this, I think, is helpful. Because if we are, under, if we are to understand that God is presently work, at work in this world, and that he is moving towards certain goals throughout history, then there should be things that we can observe in this world which testify to this reality. And so this is where we go into this idea that, okay, yes, we can see God through creation, this understanding that God is there, right? That, that again, Creation has a creator who we ought to glorify. But also, because God is still working, we see God working through history. And so these you could call, if you wanted to term them, something could be deemed as the providential acts of God. This understanding that God is still working on his creation and is still bringing a part, a story, which will bring him the most glory. And so understanding, again, God is working within history, we could look at so many different examples where, the, where God has indeed worked upon history, where his fingerprints are there. Of course, well, if we were to look in the Old Testament, many of us could uh, simply look at the survival of the nation of Israel. You see this nation, which was not the greatest of all nations, far from it. They were surrounded by all sides, by those who were hostile, antagonistic to them, yet they did not perish. Was it simply by their own strength? No. We see throughout the Old Testament that, again, God preserved them, right? It's a clear demonstration that God is working through history. But there's other examples as well. Because when we look at the New Testament, the idea when Jesus first ministered, uh, when he ministered, uh, in, you know, he became incarnate, he ministered amongst the people, we see that the the actual situation, the actual landscape in which Jesus ministered at was during a time which historians call the Pax Romana, this idea of the Roman peace. Now, it's very easy to kind of go, well, what does that mean? Why why is it significant? But when we understand that the gospel went forth, it went from Jerusalem to Samaria, uh, uh, Samaria. It went from Samaria to the ends of the world. How did it do so? Well, it utilized the reality that at that time, Jerusalem, the Jews, Judea, was part of the Roman Empire. It used the idea that there was Roman infrastructure, Roman roads. Now, we might go, oh, roads, that's nothing important. But at that time, that was a technological innovation that helped people actually get to other places much quicker than they would otherwise. It was during a time when, again, they lived during in one empire where the the Roman Empire basically spanned from Spain all the way to the Middle East, from England all the way to North Africa. And because individuals belonged to the Roman Empire, they could travel fairly unabated throughout the empire. It also, also is seen through the common tongue. The common tongue during Jesus' lifetime and during the uh, centuries 
uh, thereafter was Koine Greek. It wasn't something that only, only uh, the Greeks knew. It was indeed the, the common uh, language which was used by the Eastern Roman Empire. And as such, they were able to go out and be able to speak with the same language. They didn't go, oh, I don't know, I don't know how to actually speak to you. I need to go get a translator so I can preach you to go, uh, tell you the gospel. So when Paul from Tarsus, who is a Jew, he knew and was quite, well, fluid and uh, fluent in Greek. And so he was able to go forth and, and share with Lydia quite e easily. He was able to share the gospel much more easier than if there were separate languages throughout the Roman Empire. And so when you think, okay, the, the gospel spread and propagated so quickly, so rapidly uh, within a couple of centuries, we're able to see that God, being in his sovereign wisdom and knowledge, utilized this, under, uh, utilized this time of the Pax Romana to be able to bring forth the advancement of the gospel. But what about if we look at even more recent events? Many of us are familiar, of course, with the Reformation. The understanding, of course, of uh, Martin Luther protesting, the, uh, protesting uh, again the the social ills and theological injustices of Rome. Yet, when Luther came forward, what did that period actually look like? We see, of course, during that time, during the 16th century, that they ben already benefited from the fall of Constantinople. The Byzantine Empire had collapsed. That was what ended up becoming the Eastern Roman Empire. But what did that mean? What were the implications or the ramifications for the reformers who first popped up? It meant that the Greek manuscripts were brought westward. Now, at first, people may go, well, what does that actually mean? But you have to remember that at the time of the Reformation, most of the individuals who were cultured and literate and able to read the word of God read the word in Latin. Again, the Latin Vulgate, whilst a good translation, was certainly one dated and had, his, uh, had significant mistakes. They were able, through the likes of Erasmus and Stephanus, to actually look at the Greek manuscripts for the first time after such a long time and go, this is the truth. That means these mistakes here were wrong, and they were able to actually understand the great truths that we were later on to be, uh, be able to appreciate through the likes of Martin Luther John Calvin, and other reformers. But also during that time, we see that there were individuals who went around to spread this idea that, hey, actually, we ought not to listen to Rome and this idea that you're saved by the merit of the saints and through your own works, but instead actually look at the gospel, look at Christ. And so you had people such as John Wycliffe and Jan Hus, who also went around, which we call proto reformers, those who came before the reformers, but still had, a, in substance, a lot of the same message as the reformers. We see the time that the Gutenberg Press was created in the 15th century as well. This idea that, not, not, that individuals didn't actually have to listen and, uh, to news and then write it down themselves and then have to get other people to copy it down. No, it meant mass reproduction of the works. And so when Martin Luther and John Calvin started writing, it was able to go quickly across Europe uh, almost overnight. And so in many respects, when we look at the providential acts of history, when we look at the 16th century, we can understand by looking at all these events that God capitalized on, because again, it is part of God's sovereign plan, that really when what all Martin Luther did was strike a match for a powder keg that was ready to be lit. There's an unfortunate reality that when we look at the providential acts of history, many, many individuals, many Christians will fail to recognize the importance of being able to look at God in contemporary events. Instead of going, well, how is God working in the, during the coronavirus? How is God working during this time of, well, arguably government oppression? That they're able to go, well, what is God teaching the church? Many of them will go, well, we, let's not focus on that at all. And to, to, in re many respects, we do ourselves a disservice because when you look through not only the writings of, um, not only, well, ultimately scripture, because we know that God works through events, but also throughout church history, there was an acute understanding that God is sovereign and he is working. We have lost that, sadly. But at the same time, I'd like to caution people that we can all often go too far the other way and, and employ some form of newspaper eschatology where we go, well, the last times are going to come upon us. Let's look at the newspapers and see how we can map Revelation to it. 
Well, obviously, we're not called to go that far. So we've got this understanding that God has revealed himself through nature. God has reveals himself through the providential acts of history. But also, there is a third form. This understanding that God reveals himself through us. We are, of course, image bearers of God. We are made in the Latin, imago Dei, in his image. And so, therefore, there are certain characteristics that we are endowed with. That because, again, we are made in the image of God to reflect God, there are certain things that we reflect also which point back to him. And so, so one of these is not only regarding, of course, our faculties and abilities, the fact that we're able to think logically and, and also be able to do such things as morally reasoned and ultimately to speak comprehensively. I mean, ultimately, we could look at the rest of, cre of the creatures out there and easily differentiate, uh, differentiate ourselves from amongst them, right? We're the ones with all the buildings and the civilizations in comparison to other animals. Right? And this is indeed reflective of the fact that we were created in God's image. But there's more to it than that. Because ultimately, being created in God's image is an understanding, like what Calvin states here, that there exists in the human mind, and indeed by natural instinct, some sense of deity we hold to be beyond dispute. Since God himself has endured all men with some idea of his Godhead, the memory of which he constantly renews and occasionally enlarges. It's this understanding, ultimately, that mankind knows, by virtue of being made in God's image, that there is a God. This is something that all of us, each and every person created, ultimately has this knowledge. Now we'll go into that a bit more in a bit, but it's an understanding that ultimately, like it tells us in throughout scripture, that we are able, not only being made in God's image, to know that God exists and know that there is a God who does exist, but also an understanding that because we are made in the image of the thrice holy God, we have some sense of morality that we take from him as well. Now this morality, this understanding that we are able to somewhat know right from wrong is attested to by the Apostle Paul when he says in Romans 2 verses 14 to 15, where he states that when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a, a law to themselves. Even though they do not have the law, they show that the work of the Lord, law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness. Now, when we look throughout social anthropology, if we were to take a step back and again look into creation and look in the development of human cultures and human societies, we can see that pretty much all cultures have some semblance of law. This understanding that ultimately they formed laws based on moral goods and wrong. Now, obviously, what I'm not saying here is that they're necessarily perfect laws. We know that man did not escape the fall intact. But what we do see is some semblance of morality being displayed. This understanding, for example, that murder in most cultures, not all cultures, but in most cultures, is considered evil and considered wrong, is a testament to the fact that man has been imprinted with God's nature. So, there are, of course, are times when we see the fact that, like Paul is saying, that the law was written on the hearts and consciences of mankind. We see it through tested throughout Scripture, really. We, we understand that before the giving of the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue at Mount Sinai, the understanding of what is right and what is wrong can still be seen before that law was given. We see that murder is wrong even right in the early pages of Scripture, don't we? Because who murders who? Well... Abel, Cain murders Abel. How do we know that is wrong? Well, I don't see any verses in Scripture prior to the murder which testify to its wrongness. It is wrong because God's morality has been imprinted and written on the human heart. So, therefore, being an image bearer, we need to recognize and, not forget, and remember that we never forget the reality of God. We never forget the reality, the reality of morality. 
Everybody may, may, may argue and go into some form of moral relativity, the idea that, yes, your, that's your morality, this my morality, uh, you know, whatever works for you, it never actually works. This idea that ultimately there is a basis morality given to mankind is demonstrative through mankind. But also at the same time, we always understand there is an existence of God. So before I go into that, I, I think it's helpful to, uh, to actually do a diagram of, the, of two particular forms or ways in how God has revealed himself through natural revelation. The first is the, what we call immediate revelation. This idea that, of, that God reveals himself through something else is called mediate. This thing that God could display himself through could be arguably creation itself. We are able to see and understand God through creation. It could also be through the providential acts of history. But God is using a mediator to reflect himself to us. The other form, of course, it's immediate. And in many respects, that is how we ought to look at how God reveals himself through our conscience, by being in his nature. So God reveals himself again in a way through us, not only so we have a form of morality, but also that we may know him. And so going back into this understanding that we know the existence of God inherently, instinctively within us, is an understanding that we see throughout history. This understanding that there are different religions and different cults out there and which have existed in the past or, and have ceased existing or are still in existence today are proof of the fact that mankind is inherently spiritual. This understanding that, again, mankind is spiritual because we have been imprinted by a, a spiritual being. We indeed know there is an existence of God and the reality that every man knows God is put forward by Paul in Romans 1, 18.23, which I'm sure many of us are aware of, where it states this, For the wrath of God is revealed from, human, uh, from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth, for what can, uh, can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so that they are without excuse. For though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or gave, uh, give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, exchanging the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men, and birds, and animals, and creeping things. So there's an understanding here that all mankind knows God. But what happens? They suppress it. They refuse to acknowledge that God exists. Calvin himself puts it so clearly where he states, God shows himself in the structure of the universe so clearly that men need only open up their eyes to see him in his works. But as we see before us, Romans t testifies to the fundamental problem. God is made manifest through creation. The truth of God is visible, yet man, due to sin, due to ungodliness, due to wickedness, suppresses the truth. And this ultimately leads to the limitations of natural revelation. Because if therefore God is expressed by natural revelation, then we need to understand that if God has revealed himself to each and every individual in existence, past, present, and future, what's happened? If we've got natural revelation which testifies to the fact that God exists, and these are the things which testify to God's exist, existence, where is everyone? 
Why are no one clamoring to be with God? Paul, in his address to the Arabicus in Acts 17, 26 to 27, states this, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him. Again, natural revelation is a testament to wake up. But people suppress the truth. Again, it is not a road taken by those in sin. It is not something that ultimately creatures want to hear. They don't want to know him. God has made himself known, but creatures refuse to actually listen. And so as such, many people around us today, we see it around us. They continue their lives assuming the non-existence of God. And why is that? Because whilst everything out there testifies to the reality of God, they don't want to know the truth. They don't want, because what does that mean? If, if God existed, it means their lives are not their own anymore. So ultimately, there's an understanding here that mankind being in their sin refuses to heed natural revelation. Many, is, uh, again, many desire to live in accordance to their own desires and their own whims. And instead of being testaments to the reality that God exists, to these individuals, they are, becomes knowledge which simply becomes suppressed by their ungodly minds. This itself testifies to the fact that natural revelation is insufficient to work upon mankind and point them back to Christ. Yet, whilst I say that, it is not insufficient to condemn individuals for their actions. For we read by circling back to Romans 1, 18 to 23, it still tells us after saying how God has made himself known to them, it tells us so they are without excuse. The fact that God exists is clear. Mankind suppresses the truth and doesn't want to hear it. And for that, they are condemned. So again, we see that natural revelation points us to God. It is there so as what Paul says in his address in Acts 17, so that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him. But because people do not, they are condemned for their sin. For ultimately, we need to recognize that if there was a creator, we as creatures are obliged to obey him. And nobody wants to do that. We love our autonomy far too much. So, Paul later reminds us in Acts 17 that God commands all people everywhere to repent at the end of his address to Arabicus. Yet, still, they did not listen and turn to him. You'll notice that when he gave that message, he said, all creation testifies to the existence of God. You know that God exists. This is the God, and he demands you to repent. And what happened? Some listened and heard. Others went, no, we don't. this is foolishness. We don't want to hear this. And this ultimately is a reflection of the limitations in many respects of using natural revelation. Mankind loves their sin far too much, and natural revelation could not point you to God entirely. Because ultimately, natural revelation is only designed, is only attempted to be a signpost. When you think about it, it's meant to be a signpost just there, which points to God. Everybody walks up to the signpost and goes, well, I don't want that, and walks away. Whilst as creatures, we would, of course, be obliged by virtue of his kingship to obey this, we need to recognize that natural revelation is insufficient to show us the means of his salvation. It does not help us understand Christ. Natural revelation can't reveal that. It doesn't show us what the good news actually is. It can't reveal that. This is why we need explicit special revelation. Yet natural revelation does point us to the fact that each and every single individual is invited to look to God, is invited to seek this special revelation out. That signpost is there pointing to God, and it is an invitation to all 
to look at the signpost and to follow where it leads. Again, nobody wants to follow it. And for that, everyone is subsequently guilty. It's worth um, taking a small detour here to actually tackle the subject of natural theology. Now, at first you'll hear natural revelation and natural theology, aren't they the same thing? But they're not. Natural revelation, again, is the understanding that God has created stuff. He's created the world. He's created so many different things that we're able to observe. But natural revelation is much more than that. So to quote R.C. Sproul from this book, uh, everyone's a theologian. He states that natural revelation is something God does, where natural theologian, uh, theology is what humans do with natural revelation. Again, there's an idea in natural revelation that we are passive. God has done and revealed himself through creation. We don't need to do anything. God already has done stuff that we're able to observe and which point back to him. But natural theology is an understanding where we attempt to create a, a theological construct, a theological framework, where we're able to start going, well, what can we know about God? And, and simply put aside special revelation and seek to go to God based mostly on our deduction, our reason, and our you know, the, uh, theological, um, yeah, uh, sorry, philosophical kind of speculation to get to God and construct to God in accordance to those things outside of special revelation. The problem is, and, and arguably this is not a fruitful task for a Christian, but while it is true that God has revealed himself through creation, at most we could understand simply by looking at nat natural revelation is, is that's an understanding that God exists. We wouldn't be able to go to really anything much more definitive beyond that, and certainly not anything salvific. We wouldn't find the keys to it or the words to eternal life simply by looking at natural revelation. William uh, Paley, uh, who was an 18th century uh, Anglican minister, came up with the idea of the watchmaker analogy that some of you may be aware of. Now, w William Paley, when he talks about this, he talks about the idea that, that if you were in a desert and you were to come across a complicated device, a pocket watch in a desert, you would look at that and because of the intricacies of the pocket watch, you'd be able to start speculating that, okay, this is, the, this is a difficult and complex mechanism involved, all the gears and everything else. So these all testify to the fact that, the, that it has a creator who is infinitely more complex than the device itself, than the pocket watch itself. And so ultimately, the point of this, and it, he goes on to other things as well, but the point of this is to point out that there is a designer. Because if this logic could be applied to a pocket watch, you wouldn't go, no, that just happened by mere chance. This pocket watch designed itself. Nor would you necessarily go to and say, well, Earth, creation created itself. That was, again, his point. But the problem is, the most we could get from using these kind of arguments is an understanding that there is a supreme being. We wouldn't know anything beyond that. Yes, he's a supreme being who created things. Okay, but who is he? Well, I don't know. So at most, it, what, what people would do is be able to argue and help people become deist and understanding that there is a God, but not necessarily who that God is. And that ultimately is a limitation of this type of theology, natural theology. This is why, there, while there is room for, in, indeed, many respects, evidential apologetics, the problem is you can't simply argue it people by proofs of God's existence without pointing them to scripture. Again, the problem is the eternity that awaits a deist is the same eternity that awaits an atheist. Simply being an, a deist will not save them. And so it's an, also an understanding of, of limitation here of natural theology is that ultimately it undermines the impact of the fall. It ultimately un undermines the extent of the fall on our faculties and on our reasoning. And it, instead of going, well, ultimately, because my reasoning is faulty, how can I necessarily come to the truth? It goes, well, we, both us, 
Christians and believers and non-believers can both come across the same truth and walk away convinced. That, like Cornelius Van Til would argue, is nonsense. There is no such thing as neutral reason. And being as such, it would mean that we could come across, both a believer and an unbeliever would come across the same information, but the way they would interpret that information would be based on what they believe, already believed and the outcome of what they, what they, where they would end up would simply be a confirmation of their presuppositions. So it's an understanding here that natural theology cannot help an individual come to Christ. Natural theology also misunderstands the, the full impact of the fall. And so ultimately, a person who refuses to believe in God will attempt to interpret things in light of their position. We can't argue people into the kingdom. That is something that we all need to learn. So that's natural revelation. That's natural theology. And so we see that natural revelation is helpful, but it's limited. It can't bring us to God. It can't save us. But this is why special revelation is so necessary. In many respects, special revelation is much smaller in scope in that natural revelation is something which is given to all people. But special revelation is that which has been revealed only to some people, is the individuals who have indeed received it, who, had, who God has revealed himself to. And so in many respects, natural revelation is on the outside because everybody knows it. Special revelation would be on the inside that only a few know it. Thus, there are other names, general revelation versus particular revelation. This understanding of special revelation is that ultimately, not only is it much more specific in scope and detail, it's also that which is contained within Holy Scripture. While it is true that like natural revelation, we meet the same exact God, he is more fully revealed in special revelation. And it is this more full, fuller form of revelation which is needed to really know him. Natural revelation will tell you there's a God, but special revelation will tell you who God is. And not only that, it would actually help, uh, because it is from God himself, you know that what you learn from God by special revelation is much more authoritative than what you could learn by speculating from natural revelation. So again, for, as we covered, mankind lacks not only an ability to desire God, but also an ability to comprehend God. Well, arguably, when it comes to special revelation, unlike natural revelation in many respects, special revelation is not at all dependent upon us to interpret it. Special revelation is self-interpreting. It means that unlike natural revelation where we go, well, let's, let's think on this for a moment. Okay, we can see there is a creation which points to a creator. We can start looking at things and observing things. Special revelation is God coming forth and going, this is who I am. And as such, again, it, is, it doesn't need us for its rightful interpretation. God himself makes clear, um, clear references to us and clear claims which are not ambiguous or abstract. We are able to understand because God is clear with his revelation through his word. And so when it talks about the sinfulness of humanity, it's not unclear. It's not like we look at that and go, I, what does that mean? When it talks about that salvation is gained only for believing in Jesus Christ, this is understandable. So too, when it talks about the fact that so I lost, I lost that train of thought. But special revelation ultimately is that which makes clear that what natural theology can only point to. So again, you have the signpost, natural, uh, natural revelation, sorry. Natural revelation points to God. Special revelation makes clear what natural uh, revelation can only point to. It says that God is a creator, yes, but what does that mean? Special revelation unpacks that. We are able to understand more about God as a creator through his word because he has revealed himself. He has made himself comprehensible to us. 
And so as such, when we understand that, then it's like as Calvin says, when he says, a person who has a poor sight might be una quite unable to read two words in a book. But if he uses spectacles, he will be able to read easily. It is like this with the scriptures. They clear our blurred knowledge of God and reveal him distinctly. So it's an understanding special revel revelation makes clear what natural revelation is limited in. Now, it's true, and I, I want to take a small um, detour from this, but it is true that only Christians can fully understand special revelation in the Word of God, simply because, again, we have been given, of course, a down payment of salvation, and we have the ability through the Spirit to properly decipher what God is saying. Now, but that is not to say that there is not a certain clarity in Scripture that even a non-Christian can understand. But their knowledge is not salvific. Their knowledge of it may simply be an intellectual assent to it. They may understand what the words mean. But for them, because the Holy Spirit is absent, they'll never fully be able to internalize the truth of God's word, the truth of special revelation. So then what does, what does special revelation comprise of? What is special revelation? If we know that special revelation is God himself revealing himself to us specifically to show his character, to show himself, then what does it comprise of? Well, perhaps one of the best summaries of, on revelation is from the Westminster Confession of Faith and its derivatives. Citing the Second London Baptist Confession twice in one day, uh, might I add, I think that's a new uh, record, um, Chapter, uh, chapter 1, paragraph 1, states this. The Holy Scriptures are the only sufficient, certain, and infallible standard of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience, the light of nature, and the works of creation and providence so clearly demonstrate the goodness and wisdom and power of God that people are left without excuse. However, these demonstrations are not sufficient to give the knowledge of God and His will that is necessary for salvation. Note, he's talking about natural revelation there. Therefore, the Lord was pleased at different times and in various ways to reveal himself and to declare his will to his church. So I'll stop there. But you'll notice what the, what the composers of the confession, so the Westminster divines, I mean the Baptists tweaked it only ever slightly, but the Westminster divines are getting to the point that, again, you have natural revelation, it is useful, it points to God, but it is limited. You can't be saved by it. This is why special revelation is so needed. And the way that God has done it is through different times and in various ways revealed himself and declared his will to his church. So we can see that the confession recognizes, like I said, the limitations, but it also tells us ultimately that the ways that God has revealed himself specifically through different times in various ways, were done in a way which was clear and concise. God revealed himself in a way which was clear, concise, and ultimately was recorded. Throughout the Old Testament, we see that God used messages such as angels. We see that, when, uh, we see that throughout, of course, uh, Old Testament, the Old Testament, they all, uh, there's uh, a number of accounts of angels being sent on behalf of God to convey God's truth to individuals. We see that angels appeared, um, there were three angels who appeared to Abraham, we, including the angel of the Lord. We see when Lot was rescued that two, uh, two angels were sent for that. God uses angels, but God also uses other things we see. Again, a there's a variety of different means God has used. We see, of course, uh, occasions which are often called theophanies, this idea that God himself has appeared. We, uh, the most notable of those being, of course, the burning bush. Right? God uh, made himself known to Moses. And so through that, God was heard clear and concisely. And so we also knew, know through other examples as well that God sent prophets to convey his words and will to the people. And in each of these cases, God's explicit word is being conveyed to individuals through language so it could be understood. So sp special revelation is God clearly testifying to himself and making it clear to those who he is speaking with. Rather than being dependent upon man to rightly deduce and to reason God from observation, special revelation allows us to know him, to love him, and be saved by him 
because he has made himself so clearly and utterly known. It is to this latter bit specifically that also uh, that crucially differentiates special revelation from natural revelation. I think J.I. Packer, I've quoted him a lot today, but he, he helpfully summarizes it by stating this. General revelation, so natural revelation, lacks redemptive content. It indicates that God punishes sin, but not that he pardons it. It shows forgiveness to be needed without showing it possible. Indeed, special revelation here is intended for the profitability of humanity. That is one of the significant differences between special revelation and natural revelation. Special revelation helps us to understand God and is useful for us. And so when, we're, when we... When we um, understand this and understand that it is for the profitability of all mankind, it is only made effectual, of course, to those who actually listen and believe in God. So th this is arguably, again, that, the, the understanding that God has revealed himself to help us. And, and as such, he's made himself known so that we may know Christ, we may come into salvation. But there's something which is, li 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 uh, which is linked to that as well, which is also that God took great care to ensure that his word was not only passed to others, not only did it go from Moses, Moses heard, the book, uh, heard, the, uh, heard of, God, uh, of course, a theophany, this idea God revealed himself through the bush, Moses heard it, Moses just didn't tell other people. No, he inscripturated it. He wrote it down. And so there, there was an understanding here which is important that God made sure that this would happen, that this type of benefit or special revelation wouldn't only be to those who, in whom he was speaking to, but that it would be beneficial to those who would also come after them. This understanding, of course, helps us to underst uh, understand not only God's genius, because really it's hard to fathom or to understand a better and clearer way for God to reveal his will to us than through text. I mean, when you think about it, what media, media or what medium right, has lasted as long as a written word? It's hard to think of, a, of any other t type of form of technology which could, which could even come close. But this demonstrates the genius of God. He ensured that the word was written so he could be passed down, and as it has been through such an extensive amount of time. The importance of transmission of special revelation for the continued prosperity of God's people is particularly seen in Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 9, where after the law is given, God tells them, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I g give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. What is this getting at? Well, ultimately, it's getting that God's word ought to always be in the forefront. God's word should always be remembered. In fact, again, you'll notice here that there's, a, there's an organic passing to from, from those that God is speaking to, to what? Relay the truth to their children. This, there, there, there's an, a transmission, there's an, there's an authoritative command here to keep God's word going forth so that other future generations would benefit from God's word. This in, in, in itself is something which is seen throughout, well, ultimately, not only the Old Testament, but also the New. Because what? We have 66 books of the Bible to us today, which has been transmitted to us, which ultimately are the words of God put down so that we may benefit and profit from it. But Deuteronomy also points out three additional aspects to the nature of special revelation. The first is that it's perpetual. Like, like I've already mentioned, there's a reminder to the Israelites here that testifies 
scripture, special revelation, isn't something which is meant to end. It's not something that God said, and that was only me- uh, intended really for a particular group in time, but no longer of, revel- uh, of uh, <laughs> revelant, uh, relevance. So I've been saying the other word too much. It's now forming my uh, vocab. But it's, that is no longer of relevance to us today. No, uh, indeed, we know going into the doctrine of inspiration later, that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful. Not was useful, it is useful. So again, God's special revelation is perpetual. That's why we're constantly told to remember. And also the fact that we're called, obviously, through the idea of remembering, to act in accordance to what we know. The second is that it is covenantal. God's special revelation is covenantal. God's special revelation is generally only given to those within a covenantal framework. And what I mean by that is that God predominantly speaks to those people who he has covenanted with. If he has a relationship with them, or based simply on God, of course, then he reveals his truth to them. This is something that we see through the patriarchs, through the nation of Israel, and then to the church, which testifies this reality. God speaks to his covenant people. The last is that God's special revelation is corporate. And this is, means that God's special revelation, this salvific revelation of God testifying about himself, is not meant to only benefit one person. It is meant to benefit all of us corporately. And that is obviously something that if you know anything about the church and the importance of the church, you can understand how that fits within the corporate aspect of the church. So we understand then that prophets, theophanies, other divine acts such as dreams uh, comprised special revelation during the Old Testament, but special revelation had a movement towards a goal. Arguably, special revelation is Christological. It is most notably done and pointed to and consummated through the revelation of Jesus Christ. God the Son, who is a very incarnational embodiment of the Word of God and who serves as the supreme mediator of divine revelation. Special revelation is ultimately about Christ in whom it finds its consummation. Special revelation is salvific. It's pointing us towards a goal. Throughout when it was first given, right at, the very, uh, right at the very start to our first parents, all the way through, God is revealing himself and revealing his will and the truth and pointing us to Christ. So again, special revelation must, to, be, to fully understand special re- revelation, you must understand that it is Christocentric. Special revelation is ultimately about Christ, as, as I said, but, but after all, how it, do we know God? but through Christ. How are we saved? But through Christ. And so as the author in the letter to the Hebrews states in chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, he says, long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he created a world. He is the radiance and the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. So again, we understand through here that Christ's mediatorial kind of role goes well beyond the incarnation. It's an understanding that Paul, what Paul is claiming here is something that he also states elsewhere in Colossians 1, um, verses 15 to 17, when he says that the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, For in him are all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. This means that when God spoke in Genesis 1, the the incarnate word of God fulfilled the words. Therefore, while the Father is the sovereign author of divine revelation, in the Son, it is the Son who is the sovereign deliverer of revelation. Or if I was to put it another way, when we hear the word of God, we hear it through the voice of the Son. 
God the Spirit serves as well as the effective agent of divine revelation in the Son, and specifically in application of God's Word to us as to our need. Now, this triune affair was made most manifest when Christ, empowered by the Spirit, ministered amongst his people, informing them about the truth of God and salvation. Christ's own claims were what? Well, we see it seen notes before me when I quote John, a whole bunch of verses from the book of John or the Gospel of John. It says, My teaching is not mine, but he who sent me. And that the word you hear is not mine, but my Father's who sent me. Also stating that when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. Christ was the invisible God made visible. As Matthew records in uh, chapter 11, 27, no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. It is then therefore only fitting to cons uh, consider special revelation to be redemptive in that it points to Christ and, and the way of salvation through Christ. The divine truths of God being passed to the apostles by Christ who recorded it for the welfare of the church. So if you understand that, again, God the Son, he's the voice of God the Father in many respects to us. He reveals God the Father to us. And his words were, of course, taken by the apostles who, who learnt underneath him and written down for the welfare of the church, which is ultimately us today and all the other saints collected throughout, redempt, uh, throughout history. So the first paragraph from the Confession concludes special revelation, was, um, concludes this, uh, that special revelation was given in order to preserve and propagate the truth better and to establish and comfort the church with greater certainty against the corruption of flesh and the malice of Satan and the world. The Lord put this revelation completely in writing. Therefore, the Holy Scriptures are absolutely necessary because God's former ways of revealing his way to his people have now ceased. The Puritan John Owen, I think, helpfully puts it this way when he states that the dynamic and nature of special revelation is this. This revelation of God's will, gifted to Christ by the Father, communicated by Christ through the Holy Spirit to the apostles and others for the benefit of the entire church, taken at its greatest extent, is the divine teaching of theology of the gospel. Special revelation ultimately is consummated through Christ and the salvation found through him. I think while Owen provides a helpful definition of special revelation, perhaps the Irish, uh, Australian Irish uh, Anglican theologian T.C. Hammond provides a nice, neat summary where he goes, Revelation consists of the progressive unfolding by God of his character and purposes and mighty acts in history and through the wor uh, words of his specially designated spokesman. It begins with uh, the history recorded in the Old Testament, largely the history of Israel, and reaches its climax in the fulfillment in the coming of Christ and also in, in the establishment of his church and the determination of Christian belief by the Holy Spirit through the apostles. Therefore, the Christian revelation comprises the sum and substance of the self-revealing activity of God for man's salvation. This activity, without which uh, uh, a transcendent God could not be known, centers on Christ and is recorded in Scripture. I think that's a fairly good summary of special revelation. But again, we need to remember that special revelation has been consummated in, by, and through Christ as being its goal. Most notably, salvation is found only through Christ, who is the firstborn of creation and the radiance of the glory of God. And this re and has in re reality been recorded over the 66 books of the Bible. Additional revelation is unnecessary. Unlike the charismatics who say, I have a special word from the Lord, this does not add to God's self-revelation of himself. To quote Barvink, who I think um, really has a nice summary, Scripture is complete, now it is worked out. So again, we look at natural and special revelation, but special revelation, of course, was written down. It was transmitted by of course, the, the prophets and, and uh, other individuals in the Old Testament and the apostles in the New. So we go into this understanding of the doctrine of inspiration. Now, 
God, by he means a special re revelation, revealed both himself and the grounds upon re which reconciliation could occur through Christ, it is important to recognize how God has sought to transmit this truth to us, most particularly through his written word. For revelation given, unless recorded, for purely from a human perspective, purely from a human sta uh, standpoint, is prone to being lost beyond the immediate circle upon which it is given. If you tell me something, I may forget, uh, I may forget it in probably a week or two, if not the next day. But by transmitting it, we can make sure that it continues and that the word of God stays unblemished. And so in many ways, this is why God deemed that such revelation ought to be inscripturated. It ought to be written down. It would not be under the biases and, um, and the uh, blemishes given, given it to, to it by us, but instead it, by allowing it to be transmitted through the word, it would allow it to be benefited by future generations. It is here that we look at the doctrine of inspiration, or specifically how God has worked upon authors to record his divine truth down into what we have before us today in the Bible. This is what is meant by inspiration. This idea, the doctrine of inspiration, is, is an understanding that all scripture is taken to be God-breathed. Inspiration is an understanding I won't go into the Greek word because I'll probably mispronounce it, but the, the, the Greek word here, meaning God breathed, is an understanding, again, that God has breathed the words out and people have breathed the words in. Inspiration means inhaling. This understanding we've inhaled, the authors of who have written the word of God have inhaled God's truth that God has exhaled. This understanding is particularly fleshed out in the start of 2 Timothy um, 3.16, where Paul reminds Timothy that all scripture is what? It is God-breathed. It is exhaled by God. This is a testament to scripture's ultimately authority in that all scripture is from God. Yet more than that, it seeks to say that all scripture is inspired. All scripture fi finds its foundation in God and has been faithfully transcribed by divinely selected authors, but remains with God as being the ultimate divine author. This means, if we, if we understand that all scripture is God breathed, this would mean for us that the word of God is not to be treated like any other book. We wouldn't just go into any bookstore and go, well, this, is, this book is just as important as the word of God. No, by the, fact, by the reality of it stating that all scripture is God breathed, it is pointing out to its divine nature of God's word, which differentiates it from all other books out there. This is further confirmed in 2 Peter 1, 20, verse 21. When Peter states, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets through human spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The recording of revelation is not something that simply happens by an author. It's not that God revealed himself and then I, uh, to, to me and then I go home and go, oh, what did God say? I'm going to try to write this down. I hope, I hope I captured it rightly. No, this is a testament to the reality that when an author is transcribing the word of God, He's just transcribing, he's writing the very revelation of God, which is lively and real, as has, is and as was communicated to him. As, as the verse tells us, as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. How this was done precisely, well, I don't know. Uh, neither do a lot of others, so it takes great solace in that. There's certain understandings that when we understand that, okay, God is working on individuals. He's inspired them to write the word of God. And then, okay, so where, where does the humanness kind of factor end and the divine start? This, this is mystery. 
There's not, uh, we need to recognize again as finite beings that we cannot fathom entirely the mind of an infinite God and his ways. And so as such, I, I'm entirely happy to agree with A.W. Pink when he says that, whole, that the Holy Spirit spoke for him and wrote by men is a fact explicitly tested to by scripture, but how he influenced them is not fully revealed. However, it is entirely evident in these verses before us today, right here in 2 Peter as well as 2 Timothy, that any notion, any idea that prophecy and a recordings of God's revelation started with my or, or other people's intent is incorrect. It should be dismissed. If we start to think that the word of God was simply written by the intent of man and only by their own whims and desires. We need to dismiss that. It is untrue. These passages clearly show that such a position is false. But at the same time, we must be careful in not straying too far the other way. Well, it's true that mankind, it's not, and it wasn't mankind in their, their own desires and wants to write down the word of God simply based on, their, again, their own ability. Nor do we want to go the other way too far and go, well, the authors were nothing more than fleshly typewriters mechanically dictating the word of God. That would be untrue also. So we can't go too, too far and go, well, it's just done by man. But nor can we just go to the other way and go, well, God was just using man in a way that they couldn't think and was just dictating his words. Man's personality was still evident in their writings. Indeed, it is clear why the authors were under divine influence through the Holy Spirit that they spoke from God. That they were but prophets, though human. This is indicating that while the authors were the instruments that God used, that their personality was not superseded. It wasn't replaced. And we see that if anyone understand, and, and if anyone looks at the Gospel of Matthew and compares that to the Gospel of Luke, you'd be able to read both of those and see that ultimately their writing styles are very different, who they're addressing is different, so their personality is still made evident through, the, through their words. So even through, again, there is a divine author who has indeed inspired these authors to actually write his words, their personalities have not simply disappeared. Otherwise, they'd all sound the same. So again, what, there, there is mystery ultimately as to how this divine human interplay looks, but it would be wise not to go too far into wild speculation beyond the reality that what we see in Scripture is the fruit of both God and inspired men. How it worked, let's leave it there. That's my encouragement. Scripture also illustrates that the authors themselves were fully aware of, what, of the capacity in how they were acting. They, they, they weren't just going, well, I have no idea what I'm doing, and then later on people captured that as Scripture, and therefore... That's what we have today. No, they were fully conscious of the capacity in what they, in what, in what they were performing, what they were doing. And we see this particularly when Peter refers to Paul. And he states this, And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them, wrote to you uh, according to the, uh, sorry, of these matters, sorry, he speaks into them of these matters, there are some things in them that are hard to understand, amen, uh, which the ignorant and un unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. Peter is recognizing that Paul is not only a leader of the church. What Peter's actually saying here is that Paul's letters ought to be recognized as being at the same level as other scripture. And so th therefore, Peter's consciously aware that while P Paul is a con his own contemporary who's actually told him off, remember? He's saying, no, no, Paul's words that you have, that's scripture. That's authoritative. Ultimately, that authority points back to God. It is also evident that Peter recognized that the attempt to undermine or twist Paul's writing, 
has the same repercussion and violations as dismissing or violating or twisting any other piece of scripture, which is what? Destruction. It leads to damnation. It leads to destruction. So therefore, all scripture going back to, to Timothy is inspired. It is all God-breathed. If I was to do one last diagram, we could say that the whole idea of inspiration is the understanding that ultimately is an understanding that ultimately, it, whilst it is from God who is the divine author, it goes from human authors and it is the word of God that we have. Notice that, again, they're not separate things. It doesn't stop at the human authors. It's a continued line down. There's that synergy between both the authors as well, uh, divinely inspired authors as well as God himself. So all scripture, again, is God-breathed. It is given by God and faithfully transcribed. So what? 2 Timothy tells us, so it is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. It is this purpose of scripture to which it is perfectly geared. Yet its mechanics do not simply only apply to the idea of the concepts that Scripture betrayed. It doesn't say, well, God said generally be good, and so that's an important concept that we ought to follow, you know, because Jesus is a good uh, civil and religious leader that we ought to follow and listen to his teachings. No, the idea and authority of Scripture, being that all Scripture is God-breathed, relates to every word, every syllable of God's word. Every paragraph is god Grieved. It's an understanding, again, that the precise formulations of Scripture are not only essential to the believer, but are divinely orchestrated to that end. God is perfect. He doesn't make mistakes. Now, this belief, of course, we see clearly testified within the treatment of Scripture, not just by Peter alone when he talks to Paul, but also in the apostles, prophets, and most specifically Christ. Jesus and the New Testament writers regarded every word and syllable of the Old Testament as being significant and being authoritative due to its basis being in God. Now, at times we see that their hermeneutics, the way that they interpreted the scriptures, evident that this, they had a high view, they had an understanding that they were working on and they were citing the very word of God themselves. And you'll see that in what, particularly when you have the um, ability to understand that some of the original languages, you're able to understand that certain, uh, sometimes when the New Testament authors actually cite scripture in the Old Testament, they'll do things which, uh, which again, rely on certain word plays, uh, reliant on certain ways that the, the, how it's, uh, the, the sentence is framed grammatically that many of us would miss out on. But th they see that even the, the smallest detail of the Old Testament is important. And so forth, and, and they also see, in many respects, that, the, that God's word is ultimately authoritative. They understand that it is all from God. And you'll see that also in, some, in certain cases in the New Testament, when they cite pieces of scripture in the Old Testament, and instead of attributing, oh, this is by that prophet or this is by that person, they'll go, God said. So they recognize that it is from God. But so too it would be wise to also acknowledge the understanding of the divine authority in which they viewed the Old Testament. Many times when you read the, the New Testament and when they cite the Old Testament, there's a common pattern that they'll refer to. It is written. They recognize themselves that ultimately because Scripture is self Old Testament scripture specifically, is from God. Therefore, they'll go, it is, it, it is written. Have you not heard? This is from God's word, and it is authoritative. Christ himself, uh, of, of all people, himself talks about uh, and uses this type of language when he is confronted by the devil. The devil can confronts him in the desert, and what does he say? Well, he says... It is written 
Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. There's an understanding here of the self-attestation of Scripture, the understanding that of the divine authorship of Scripture, that all of Scripture is from God. They understood that. And in many respects, this is not only evident by Peter's reference to Paul, but by the New Testament's author's um, use of the old. It shows that Scripture is organically built upon itself. It sees that it all together is Scripture. It's not certain portions which are Scripture and certain portions are less uh, Scripture. The only certain portions are inspired and other portions are not inspired. All of Scripture is God-breathed. Now, all of them may be inspired for different purposes that we may look at and go, well, obviously, when... Um, when, jo when Job's friends are exhorting him and telling him wrong things, we're not meant to read what Job's friends say and that, that's who we ought to follow. No, it's not inspired in such a way that we, can, that we are, ought to take it in such a fashion. It's taken in a way that it's a rejoinder and a reminder and a warning not to fall into the same trap. But there's an understanding here that all of, uh, within Scripture itself of the authors themselves fully understand the intra- Textual dependency, which means all the scripture together, there's a, there's a textual dependency upon itself, which is authoritative. They recognize that. Perhaps a, a, good, inspiration, a good summary of insp or definition of inspiration is given by the American theologians, A. a. Hodge and B.B. Warfield, when they say that inspired, uh, inspiration is God's continued work of superintendence, so his supervisory kind of role, by which his providential, gracious, and supernatural contributions having been presupposed, he presided over the sacred writers in their entire work of writing with the design and effect of rendering their writings an errorless record of the matters he designed, them, uh, he designed them to communicate, and hence constituting the entire volume in all parts the Word of God to us. Special revelation has been transmitted into the Word of God that we have, that has been faithfully transmitted to us by God. And that is a helpful understanding that when we look at the Word of God, it is all God-breathed, it is all useful, and that is itself how the New Testament authors understood scripture, and also how the Old Testament authors recognize uh, scripture to be when they quote themselves also. So inspiration, the, that is the doctrine of inspiration. That is also the doctrine of revelation. I hope that's been uh, somewhat helpful. Um, and next week we'll go into the next bit of uh, bibliology, uh, particularly, uh, particularly before we go into canonicity. Um, that's me for today. And are there any questions? It's a very uh, subdued and uh, quiet group. Oh, any, uh, anyone else? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, it's not planned. Absolutely, you could look at uh, that in, in the sense that Christ is ultimately the mediator, all right? He is reflective of God the Father. So in some ways, you could look at Christ as being having a, a medi uh, immediate kind of um, yeah, a, a, a immediate kind of role in that sense of revelation. Uh, of course, when I'm talking about this, this is particularly when it comes to natural revelation, not specifically Christ, who is ultimately the consummation of special revelation. Hmm. Another question. Okay. Uh, well, ultimately, again, this is going to natural revelation. Paul's um, special revelation is sometimes called, and I think we'll all understand why, supernatural revelation. So when we're, when we're looking at this, this is particularly the way that God has revealed himself through natural revelation. When Paul was converted or saw, uh, uh, saw, um, conf uh, was confronted by our Lord on the road to Damascus, that was a supernatural affair. And so in many respects, whilst he was, of course, Paul is, uh, and, or Saul was an image bearer of God, um, that itself was more due to the supernatural impact of God, of Christ on that road, of his revelation to, uh, to Saul. Yeah. 
Yeah, so this, this is more natural revelation, forms of natural revelation. So uh, this could be uh, creation in there, could be history in there, and that's how God makes himself known through natural revelation to us. Whereas this is more, when we we're looking at immediate um, revelation, uh, natural revelation, we're talking about how God makes himself directly known to us through writing, well, basically imprinting himself on us through uh, writing his law on our hearts, etc. Okay. Mm. So going back to natural revelation, mm -hmm. because God would use natural revelation to illustrate to us his characteristics, like in the Bible when he says, he will cover you with his pinions and under his wings. So he used the bird and No, no, but that's special revelation because you're appealing to scripture. Oh, so even when he says, I am the door, which is a man-made object, mm. But, but can, can, can we know that without going to the Bible? No, no, but that's the thing, but you're saying he used through his word, right? Yeah. And so we, we can understand more about his word in the way he's revealed himself through special revelation, which is in the, in the written word. But those things that you say, can I know those things if I was just to see God and try to observe God in reality without scripture at all? And that's the that would be the main difference. Natural revelation can't appeal but to special revelation in that sense. It's confirmed by special revelation, right? But natural revelation can't necessarily reveal those truths. That's why we need special revelation. But in the way he condescends to use those languages. Well, to special revelation, but still that's still, that's still special revelation. All right. Uh, any, anyone else is uh, hogging a bit? Sergio. Oh. Uh, sure, sure. So ultimately, all of, all of humanity, regardless, or regardless if we're uh, in Christ or not, all of humanity in, in, uh, throughout history has understood that we can only know God through revelation. There needs to be some way that God has revealed himself to us. So if we were to look at the Roman pantheon, of, of course, a religion or cult which is now defunct, Right? We understand for, for looking at uh, well, Ro Roman, the Roman kind of cult, uh, religion or cult that they understood that God needed to reveal himself so they could practice rightly. They could do their, their rituals in the temple and so forth. And so in many respects, part of natural revelation, the fact that Christ has, uh, well, God has imprinted himself to us is an understanding that we're inherently spiritual and we know that there's a God. But the only, there's also a subcategory from that is that the only way we can know God is by him revealing himself to us. And so that understanding is not something unique to Christianity, but it's most fully fleshed out and made known within the words of God, so, by, so within Christianity. Hmm. Hope that helps. Yep, Lawrence. Uh, that, that would be special revelation. So that would be because God himself made himself known uh, f explicitly uh, through special acts, through the miraculous and so forth. You could, of course, look at that as being a providential act of God's history, but, but because that, I would argue, is a supernatural, uh, clearly con uh, concise act of God, which is, of course, written within God's word, I, I think that would fall more within a uh, supernatural act. It's certainly, uh, Balaam's ass is certainly a, a, a very different kind of a miracle that, or, or supernatural um, or self-revelation of God outside of theophanies and dreams and other things. So it's a, certainly a unique <laughs> instance. Oh, deist, deist. Yep, yep, yep. So, so what is deism? Yep, no, no, good, that's a good question. So deism is the understanding that there is a God. But as to who that God is, people just go, well, it could be many things. I, some people, there are a lot of people out there, uh, Anthony Flew, who uh, was a late um, philosopher, uh, was once an atheist, so didn't believe in God, and then came to an understanding that it was a God, but not the Christian God. So he, just, he was happy to believe that God created a world and then stepped back and let the world run by itself. 
So deism is just an understanding that there is a God without necessarily uh, describing who that God is. Mm. All right. I think, uh, oh, Mateo? One question. Uh, this is God's understanding. Mm. Mm. But what's assurance to the Christian that he can have assurance as long as he has the word of God um, or some helpful category to understand that condescension? Sure, sure. Uh, obviously, um, like I mentioned um, today, there's no, there's no such thing, obviously, as neutral, uh, neutral knowledge or uh, neutral reason. And so when, when we have individuals who would disagree or, or find areas, often they're, they're, I think, and I think Todd has mentioned this before, often excuses. But in many respects, I think that we know that God is, is works within creation, right? God works within history. And not only has God revealed himself, which ultimately is our supreme authority, but because God has said that he had revealed himself throughout history as well, and we see that through the Old Testament, we see that within the New Testament, there's evidence of that which points to and confirms God's truth, right? And so the, the idea that God has consented, that God has made himself known, well, there's a lot of proof out there which confirms scripture. But the difference is, and, I, and touching on what I mentioned last week, we need to always make sure that we don't simply jump into evidence without going to the Bible. No, by the scriptures are authority. It's said that God has done this. So we go to the unbeliever and we tell them, no, no, God has condescended. He has made himself known. He sent his son, which is ultimately the main uh, way of special revelation. You could even argue the main form of condensation, right? Because he's made himself most gloriously known through his son. And so as such, we can see, well, because he sent his son, he condescended. We know these things to be true, not only because the things that Christ has said is correct, but also this proof that Christ existed, that Christ was sent, that Christ um, was someone that the apostles themselves believed to actually have spoken true words and was God himself, etc. So you'd point them to the realities of what's not only in Scripture, but also the, the confirmation of what we can find in the world around us, which confirms the truths of God. Does that kind of answer what you're... Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Mateo. All right, I think that's everyone. Oh, Ben? Yeah, no, no. Well, well they, they would claim, yes, it is special revelation, right? Uh, I have a word from the Lord. It's unique for me. Well, it's understanding the nature of, of special revelation. Now, again, like, like uh, um, I touched upon earlier, special revelation is not meant to be for the individual. It's meant to be taken corporately. It's meant to benefit the church. Now, that, that's an important understanding, and you could say foundation of special revelation. But more than that as well, I think that when people say that, well, I'm going to confer to the Puritan John Owen here, where he would go, well, does, um, does um, this revelation affirm what's in Scripture? And if you go yes, then it's unnecessary because we have Scripture. Yeah. Does it contradict Scripture, right? Does it go against Scripture? And then if it does, then, well, there's, it's wrong. And, and so it, it's an understanding, again, that, okay, God's self-revelation through his word, through Christ particularly, is the pinnacle of revelation. It's a, it's a full consummation of revelation. We don't need any further consummation because the words of life have been made so clear and, and pointed. It's there, right? That we can be saved through the Lord Jesus Christ by what? By believing in him, by obeying and, and submitting ourselves to him as our Lord and Savior, right? And so that, an understanding that, okay, I have a special a form of uh, a special revelation. Well, what's the point of it? Uh, scripture tell, uh, itself uh, tells us that in Hebrews at the start, but again, he spoke through different ways in the past, but now he speaks through his son. And he has spoken through his son, through his word. Hmm. So that, that would be at least my two cents for what they're worth. Oh, Austin. Sorry, starting to what you were saying, hmm. um, you mentioned if um, it goes contrary to scripture, then it's wrong. And if it is uh, in line with scripture, then it is unnecessary. unnecessary. 
well, ad, well, Scripture itself tells us uh, throughout uh, well, a handful of times that the adding of Scripture, uh, or adding to of Scripture, is uh, not something that people should do simply because, uh, again, uh, Scripture sees itself as a closed canon. And I'll get into that in canonicity uh, in two weeks' time. But I think that's the first thing. We need to understand that, okay, uh, firstly, who are we to, ha- to try to add to Scripture? Um, how do, who, how do we even have the same authority? We can see the authority of all these people who revealed, who revealed uh, and wrote down God's word simply because of who they were and the, um, the, and the different you know, uh, realities. I mean, in the Old Testament uh, and also recorded in, I think Sproul goes over in Everyone's a Theologian, there was a, a kind of a, a, a tridactic formula that was carried out, including the, the fact that, well, you're, you're saying something. You're saying you, you received a vision. Well, uh, are there miracles around? No, no, there's no miracles which testify to your authority. Um, okay, um, does it actually come to pass? You know, if not, can we stone you? You know, uh, all, all things like that, which are, are categories which preserved and showed that indeed words of uh, prophecy actually came from God if they passed all these things. If we just say, oh, wait, I've got a word from the Lord and it adds to God's uh, scripture, well, we don't need any additions. We have the words of salvation. What more do we need, right? Uh, so, yeah. Thanks, Austin. Yeah, Daniel. Um, they, they, they do. Um, so obviously, when, when most people think of special revelation for the act of dreams, many of us would ov- obviously think of Joseph, right? The, the whole idea when he interpreted, uh, dr- well, received dreams himself, but also interpreted dreams. Um, absolutely, that would have been a form of special revelation. But the, re- but the reality is, and this is going back, on, uh, back to Hebrews 1, right? Uh, the, the first few verses where it says that, again, God spoke for a v- variety of different ways throughout the Old Testament. But in the new, again, he has now spoken through his son. We don't need, that, that was, uh, so any, that was basically, again, the final consummation, uh, the ultimate consummation of special revelation. So when it comes to people going, oh, I'm getting special dreams uh, or dreams today, which I have heard cases of, particularly from, uh, you know, the Middle East where individuals have had dreams of, of Jesus and, you know, they then go to a church. I'm not, go- I'm, not, I'm not going to necessarily say that, oh, they're, all, they're, li- they're lying. But what I am saying is that it's not special revelation in the form that is salvific uh, because it can't replace the word of God. It's not salvific in the sense that it, it can't necessarily um, show them the way to Christ because the only way to know Christ ultimately is through his word. We know how can people come to, to faith, but by hearing the word of God. Well, it, not, it, it may be a delusion, it may, it, but it may be that God, we, don't, we don't want to sit, sit back and box God in and go, God doesn't do anything in this world. We know that he works through providential acts of history as well. But it's just an understanding that we, we should just be ca- uh, cautious in necessarily attributing these things as legitimate uh, acts of um, special revelation or, or, um, you know, or dismissing them out of hand as well. I think we can go too far either way.